Thank you all for your patience and attention. I, I, I think I'm going to be shorter, but once I get started, you never know. Uh, so the, um, the question that I'm going to try to address myself to is when you started to do your work with the transgender community, how did you understand the needs of trans people and now looking to the future, how has your vision changed? You know, it's, uh, when I gave my biography, I said I've been working with the trans community for 30 years. And so I started that count from uh, when I was a first a graduate student and started working on the research that ended up being my first book, uh, Gender Blending. But I think I'd like to start the story a little earlier than that because my colleagues have all started their stories a little earlier than that. Um, because my interest, of course, in what we now call trans goes back much further than that. Uh, we didn't have the word trans even when I started, <coughs> excuse me, when I started doing my research. Um, I think Virginia might have started using it by then, but it certainly wasn't part of the public vocabulary and I didn't know the word back then. If I look back to, you know, childhood, where did it all begin? Uh, I think that in some ways my feeling about the needs of the trans community have changed a lot and have changed very, very little. Because from the beginning, I never really understood why we made these gender distinctions. Why do we have these strict lines between male and female? As a little kid, I didn't understand that. Growing up, people would look at me and they couldn't understand me that way either. And the impetus for writing my first book, Gender Blending, which was about women who accepted that they were called women, that that's what they were, but other people were confused about them. And they would look at them and they would think, I think this is a man. I'm not sure if this is a man. Maybe this is a man, maybe this is a woman. Or sometimes they were completely sure they were talking to a man, but the person they were talking to was completely sure that they were a woman. And I had lots of experiences like that. And at the time that I started doing that research, nobody had ever spoken about that. Nobody had spoken about it in public. I had never spoken about it. And when I started looking for people to interview about experiences like that, person after person after person said, I've never talked to anybody about this. Because it was embarrassing. It was a source of some shame because you were supposed to fit in. And people didn't have the word transgender, they certainly didn't have the word gender queer. To the extent that the word queer was around, at that point it was still a nasty word. It was something that people said with a sneer to put you down and make you feel bad. So my entree into the trans community kind of came through, yes, my own experiences. I had no idea that was called trans. Then I had these experiences of people thought I was a man. I thought I was a woman. I didn't really mind them thinking I was a man because I also kind of felt like that fit too. But in the world that I lived in then, is, uh, we're talking about starting from sort of the mid-60s into the mid-80s, uh, that was not acceptable. That was not okay. There was no name for it. There was no words for it. And when you talk to people over and over again, they say, I've never spoken to anybody about this before. Well, that makes it, that means you're talking about something that was unspeakable, that was unnameable. And unspeakable is not a good thing to feel you are. As, uh, one of my colleagues said, you know, uh, was I a freak? Yeah, that was to be a freak. So my entree into actual academic trans kinds of stuff was when I decided to write that book and I started doing the research and talking to these people. I wrote it, wrote it up, I didn't have the word trans. I tried to think, well, what am I gonna call this? And what I came up with was to say, well, these people are blending gender. And they're blending gender in a way, and you know, it's kind of silly, but kind of, you know, put it in a blender, you hit blend, <laughs> and you can't separate it again afterwards. Right? It's mixed. And the world didn't know how to deal with that. Uh, but even prior to that, my vision of trans goes back a, a little earlier than that. So I, I have this um, memory, you know, Stephanie was saying you had a dream and you can remember vividly all these years later. I have one of those vivid memories. In the early 1970s, um, that was well before my transition, I was uh, a feminist, I was a lesbian, and along with another uh, lesbian feminist. We organized what I, I still think, I, I haven't done any research to double check on this, we think was the first um, lesbian conference in Canada. And I think it was 1972, it might have been 1973, it took place in Toronto in uh, a place that later became a women's club, at that point it was a YWCA, 
And we went around to the kinds of lesbian clubs where you had to know which door it was and you had to have the password to get in, right? And, uh, and what's the secret word? And <laughs> there's no sign on the door. And we tried to ask people at those places to come to our conference and they threw us out because they thought we were nuts. <laughs> uh, and uh, when we had the conference, it was no publicity, no photography, no names. It was those days. You know, people were underground. I remember sitting at a table but I was a feminist, right? Sitting at a table and someone came up to me who was you know, old school lesbian, old school dyke, and said, what is it you want? You want there to be no differences between men and women? You want us to all be the same? You know, she was, she was like a little aggressive and angry. <laughs> and I remember talking to her about, no, my vision is that we should have everything possible available to all of us all the time. And if you want to get up in the morning and you want to be very masculine in the morning, and in the evening you want to be very feminine, and you want to go to work this way, and you want to go to play that way, it should all be available. I see way more variety, way more range of gender. So this feminist doesn't want to make everybody the same. I want everybody to have as much difference as possible and as much flexibility as possible. Change as many times as you want, as often as you want. So that was 1972, maybe 1973. And when I talked about that, I felt like I was channeling it from somewhere else, you know, I just had this experience. So, in some ways, my vision hasn't changed at all. You know, that was where it started. And then I finally, at some point, I made contact with um, the trans community. I started, uh, wrote this book, Gender Blending, that got me a little, little bit of attention. And then I thought, well, actually, before it was published as a book, I wrote it first as my master's thesis. And then I said, gee, I guess I have to get a doctorate. I, I tried to get them to turn that into a doctorate, but they wouldn't do it. So I have to get a doctorate because I wanted to be a professor. I said, what's the next step? Well, maybe I should talk to, this is the way my thinking went at the time, maybe I should talk to women who actually want to be men because the gender blending was about women who were mistaken for men. So that brought me into the trans men community. And at that point, again, language evolves, it changes. At that point, it wasn't trans men, it was female to male transsexuals, or F to M. We were still establishing F to M, and at that point it was, was it F with the number two, or was mm -hmm. it F with the T, right? But it was F to M, but which way would you write it? And, and you know, when I finally wrote the book, I had a long discussion with Jameson Green, and I was leaning towards the two, and he convinced me to use the T, and I'm glad he did, he was right about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that stuck for a long time, and, and now that's dropping away as well. Uh, so I started meeting people because that's who I wanted to talk to. And um, Rupert Raj was a tremendous assistance to me. Uh, you've heard his name come up a few times and he's sent his regrets that he couldn't be here. Uh, he knew a lot of people um, and I put some advertisements out. I want to talk to people who are trans men or at that point I was saying female to male. And he introduced me to a lot of folks. And I remember this is before the internet. Okay, so how do you find trans people before the internet? How do trans people find each other before the internet? There weren't organizations, there weren't conferences, there were not, you know, all of the different groups that we have. None of that stuff had happened yet. Everybody was underground, everybody was hidden. There was a few people, one and two in each major urban center who were out, who were the brave souls, who were taking the barbs. Rupert was one of those, Jason Cromwell was another, mm -hmm. Jameson Green was another. You know, there were a few people, Jude was out there. Um, and, and those people helped me because they were known and they were willing to talk to me. They checked me out <laughs> and we had our long conversations and they decided, okay, you can just trust this person. Because remember, I wasn't trans yet. Right? So, and I wasn't identifying in trans in any public way. And so why should they trust me? when the world was a kind of hostile place at once then. And Rupert was the central person, but the other people I mentioned all helped as well. Rupert actually had a mailing list, and he sent out my request for participants, the 50 people on his mailing list. And, and, and so I was able to reach people who were not in the least bit public and not the least bit out. And that allowed me to really learn. And those people sat down with me, and were so generous, and they spent hours talking to me, just hours and hours, and answered all sorts of intimate questions. I'm thinking about Viviana, what you said about, you know, people have to know they're safe, and part of knowing they're safe was, okay, if Rupert recommended me, it was probably safe. Um, and that's where I really started to learn 
um, trans community. Now, another big entree to me was that I got asked to sit on the board of directors of the International Foundation for Gender Education. And I was asked to sit on that board because at that point, they were um, pretty much all trans women. Mm -hmm. They were all trans women. <clears throat> and they were even mostly uh, cross-dressing trans women and not very many uh, transsexual women. And they invited me because they wanted to meet trans men and get trans men to be involved. I wasn't trans, but I knew the trans men, and so they wanted to use me as a bridge. So, you know, I served for, I can't remember, a year or two years or something, and then I got trans men involved, and then I backed out. But I spent a bunch of time going to IFGE conventions and sitting on IFGE boards, and that's where I met Virginia, and uh, um, Marissa Cheryl Lynn, and Betty Ann Lynn, and, and, and um, uh, Yvonne Cook and uh, you know a whole lot of people who are lots more names of, uh, and, and it was a real education for me that broadened my knowledge of the trans community. So I had come in through gender blending females and then I started to learn about trans men and then I started to learn about cross-dressing women and uh, or trans women who are cross-dressers and then I started to learn about trans women and to see all of those communities in action and to have interesting conversations and to hang out and to party and to get into the politics and, you know, a great education for me. So, you know, I learned there. Published the FDM book that got me a lot of attention. I met more people. I went to do more lectures in more places. I went to more conventions, more parties. You know, I learned the, <laughs> learned the community. At some point, Long after the penny dropped for everybody else, the penny dropped for me, and I realized, oh, I need to transition. <laughs> some of you have known me for a long time, and are probably going, yeah, we knew that long before you did. And, and people said that to me, oh, good that you finally figured it out. Um, so uh, those of you who were at the opening the other night heard a little bit of the story about what that was like here. I, I have to tell you that my transition was wonderful. But I'll also tell you that working up towards making that decision, I had to face all of my fears. Because you don't know until you get there whether your friends, your family, your job, your livelihood is all going to kiss you goodbye. You don't know where it's going to go bad. So first I had to face all those fears and decide, okay, this is worth it. I'm willing to, to risk all of that. Uh, but then when it actually happened, it was beautiful. I. I didn't bring, I probably should have, I have a scrapbook full of all the cards and letters and media attention that happened around that time, and it's all positive. The most negative comment I got from anybody in all of the feedback I got at the time of my transition is there was an article that um, the Canadian National um, News Magazine, it's like Time Magazine, for those of you from the States, McLean's in Canada, uh, did in, uh, two articles. One was a little piece of, about me, and another was a piece about gender transition in general. And the guy quoted me, as, and I don't remember now what the quote was, he quoted me saying something, and I got a handwritten note from a lady in Toronto who said, who corrected me on my grammar. <laughs> and she said, as a dean of graduate studies, you should know better than to say, and then she quoted whatever it was. And I don't even know if I said it or if that's just what the reporter wrote down, but that is the most negative comment I've ever had in my entire transition. Yes. You gotta love her. Um, I got a lot of media attention, which I um, didn't really want, but uh, I will say that there's a good side to that which is, I don't think I've ever, well, it's not true, I can remember a couple of times. Once I was visiting some relatives in South Africa. But there may have been only one other time in all the years since I've ever had to tell anybody that didn't know. Everybody finds out because it's public knowledge. And so on the one hand, it was kind of torturous to have my life spread across all these newspapers and all across the internet. McLean's Magazine, Globe and Mail, you know, I mean, all over the place. On the other hand, it's been actually a gift in some ways because all those torturous conversations where you have to, am I going to tell them, how are they going to take it, I don't ever have to have those conversations. I just have to wait a little while. Not everybody knows immediately, but everybody knows after a little while. So you know, these things have two sides. Um, I transitioned at the beginning of my term as dean. Uh, being dean of graduate studies at a university this size is a very, very big job. 
and it's very all-consuming. And so uh, my my research, my work with the community, kind of went on the back burner for basically ten years. Uh, however, during that time, everybody knew I was trans. There was a steady trickle of people to my door who said, "Can I talk to you about something?" <laughs> All right. Lots of parents came, wanted to talk about their kids. Lots of students would find their way in. I remember one student came in and talked to me, and he found out by looking on the internet that, wow, there's an expert on trans here at my own university. And after he left, because I'd said something about me, after he re left, I realized, I don't think this guy knows I'm trans. That was amazing to me. But generally, lots of students and so on, but it was a, a trickle, and it was kind of in the background. Interesting thing that would happen because of the, the fame, uh, you know, because it's news that everybody knows, is I had all these colleagues at the university, we had professional relationships. The fact that I was trans was never an issue, it was never a conversation, it was just in the background. And then one by one, they'd take me aside and they'd say, I hope you don't mind, can I talk to you about something personal? And it would turn out that somebody in their family mm -hmm. or somebody that they'd gone to school with mm -hmm. was now coming out as trans. And we would have that little conversation and I was able to be helpful to them. And then we didn't talk about it again. And for me, that's, I like it. Like, I like it being like that. Sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it's not. And we talk about it when it's relevant. So off the corner of my desk, while I'm being dean, Ricky told you the story at the beginning of where, you know, we're having this conversation and what's happening to the Ricky Swin Institute and, and you know, it wasn't, I didn't plan to make a transgender archives. <laughs> you know, we just had this conversation and it started to happen and so the transgender archives started off the corner of my desk and it grew. And it grew, and I ran into Stephanie, and we had some more stuff come, and Monica Erickson gave me a call, and some more stuff came. And when I finished being dean, it's quite nice that, you know, uh, faculty members get sabbaticals. Uh, people who have served in administrative positions for a long time get administrative leave. And so I've had two years of research leave. Uh, which means that I've had two years to devote entirely to the transgender archives. And it has been a tremendous pleasure. What's my vision now? What do I think the future holds? Well, I come back to the story I started with. I don't think my vision of trans has changed that much. Where I see us going, where I want to see us going, is to be able to understand, recognize, support, and as an archives have the history, but as a community going forward as well, to allow every expression of gender to have its space, to be what it wants to be, to be who you want to be, when you want to be, and to not lock anybody in anywhere. To not lock people into you're a transsexual and that's your identity. You know, you have to be, you've chosen this, now you have to stick with it. <laughs> I think that we need to give everybody room to be however they want to be, whenever they want to be, wherever they want to be. You know, maybe that's a supremely liberal position. That's, I like it. I want us all to have the freedom to express who we are and to grow, because who we are changes. Right? You're, you're sitting here looking at the, what we've called the Founders Panel because Laura accepted. All the rest of us are old. Um, and we've all changed over our lives. <laughs> And we're going to keep on changing. And we need to have room for that. So my vision, I think it's perhaps gotten a little more sophisticated. One of the things I'm really happy to see is that when I first talked back in the 70s, whatever it was, about what I thought the future, sh what gender should be like, I thought I was the only one that thought that way. I thought I would never see it in my lifetime. And I'm starting to see it. And I'm very happy that we're carving out space to allow people to have that freedom. And so I thank all of you for what you're doing, for your part of it, and I look forward to the future. <laughs>